Good morning. I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for July 11th, 2023. Today I'm going to discuss the fantasy world of the NATO leadership as they're meeting in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, the, the main topic is, of course, the Ukraine war, how to carry out the plan to break apart Russia, affect a regime change, get rid of Putin, and so on. But to listen to the leaders in, in their bravado covers up the real problems that NATO is facing. The collapse of the European economies, the loss of a consensus which is emerging, uh, and the latest threat to the unity was the U.S. decision to deploy cluster weapons. So I, I would say if you want evidence of the craziness of the leadership of the transatlantic forces, for their refusal to accept the idea of a negotiated settlement to Ukraine, all you have to do <clears throat> is look at the events surrounding this conference, this summit taking place in Vilnius. Again, let's start with Biden's decision to send cluster munitions to Ukraine. Uh, this is a war crime. There's no way around it. His own press secretary two years ago said using cluster weapons in Ukraine would constitute a war crime. Now he's doing it. Now his excuse was that the U.S., he said, is running out of ammunition to send. Is this true? Well, the Pentagon denies it. Uh, but NATO members are running low. The ability to uh, have their broken economies gear up military production has been a discussion point of NATO summits for the last couple of years. It, uh, it is a problem because of green ideology, because of deindustrialization, uh, they're not prepared for this kind of situation. Now, the, the other question here is, isn't it Russia that was supposedly running out of ammunition? Now, we also were told sanctions would collapse Russia. It hasn't happened. We're told Putin is weak. Well, actually, what we're seeing is that the West is desperate, whereas Putin continues to be in... Uh, control of the situation in Russia, and it's NATO that's reacting to what Russia is doing. Now, another question, will cluster weapons change the situation on the ground? Will it help Ukraine's vaunted counteroffensive? The military consensus is no, it will not. These are old weapons. Uh, the problem that Ukraine faces is much larger than just the question of ammunition. It's a question of soldiers. It's a question of a strategy. And the situation is very dire for the Ukrainian military. Now, the next question is, given the nature of the weapon, who's the victim in this? It will kill some Russian soldiers, but it will also kill many Ukrainian civilians into the future because cluster bombs don't always go off and they, they can last in the soil for years. Uh, Hun Sen, the prime minister of Cambodia, sent out a message yesterday. Cambodia was hit hard by U.S. cluster bombs during the Vietnam War. Civilians were killed, but there are tens of thousands of people in Cambodia who have arms missing, legs missing, uh, bodies disfigured by cluster bombs. And Hun Sen said that Ukrainians will be the victims 50 years from now because there'll be unexploded cluster bombs on the soil. Uh, this will also damage the land for food production. But what does that genius, the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, say? Sending cluster bombs to Ukraine is a, quote, humanitarian gesture. War is peace, peace is war. This is the kind of doublespeak that the world is seeing from the United States, and it's on display the, uh, today and tomorrow in Vilnius. Now, we also have this question of the willingness now of Turkey to accept Sweden as a NATO member. Does bringing Sweden and Finland actually protect NATO from a Russian threat? The question is, what threat? The, the borders between Russia and Finland and Sweden have been peaceful for many, many years. There's no Russian threat. The special military operation in Ukraine was the result of a specific series of, of, of concerns, namely Russia's concern 
that after eight years or even as many as 15 years of pleading for keeping NATO off the border of Russia, that the decision to bring Ukraine into NATO, which hasn't been made yet, but with bringing NATO weapons into Ukraine and the killing of people in the Donbass, most of whom were of Russian ethnic origin, uh, threatened the security of Russia. Putin kept raising this and it was never addressed. The idea of a hostile Ukraine on Russia's border that could be used by NATO after the Maidan coup in 2014, which was orchestrated by the United States, that's what Putin was concerned with, not anything in, in Sweden or Finland. So the idea that this somehow makes the situation more secure for the West is just another one of these frauds. Now, one side note here, the Brits are very upset that Ben Wallace, their uh, defense minister, has not been uh, chosen to be the next head of NATO. Wallace is a mediocrity. He's someone who brings nothing to the table. Of course, so is Stoltenberg. But the idea that the Brits have to be kept out because the Brits are the most insanely committed to this destruction of Russia shows at least someone at NATO is, is thinking a little bit. Now, the, the other question about the isolation of Russia, that the war has shown that Russia is isolated, that's nonsense. What it shows is that the West's ability to bully the rest of the world to support it no longer holds, that the bullying of countries to take sides is not working. The global South is rising up against the anti-growth policies of the, of the green ideology against the enforcement of economic austerity, which has prevented their economic development. And so we're seeing moves with the BRICS, with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, to establish alternative economic mechanisms that will actually allow for development, many of which are directly related to the China Belt and Road Initiative and their plans for massive spending for infrastructure development, for corridors of development, of connectivity, and so on. So what we're seeing is the, the beginnings of this new paradigm that we've been talking about at the Schiller Institute. Now, the, the real issue behind the war in Ukraine and the threats of war over Taiwan, it's easily identified by asking the question, what is it that Russia wants? Russia wants to defend its nation as a sovereign state, protecting the population in Russia, and defending the ethnic Russian population in eastern Ukraine from attack. And then ask yourself, what is it that the U.S. and the U.K. and NATO want? They want to defend the rules-based order. And that means rejecting the sovereign interests of nations. It means demanding adherence to an economic model and economic rules which benefit Western corporate cartels and Western billionaires at the expense of the people in the former colonies who are being pushed to accept the idea of a rules-based order. To defeat this, you have to have a higher peace movement that will bring the U.S., the populations of the United States and the European Union to reject the idea of the rules-based order. We have no right to impose our model on other countries. Uh, isn't that what the authoritarian policy is, to insist that there's only one way to do it and it's our way? And that's why there's a rejection. So what's necessary is to win people in the West, the population, and this is hard because they're under intense uh, pressure from censorship and, and media brainwashing and so on where we're told that our enemies are Russia and China and Iran and North Korea and the global South, immigrants from the South, instead of recognizing that the real enemies to our populations exist inside the government, in the permanent bureaucracy, in defense, in intelligence, in the State Department, and, and so on. So people in the West, rather than seeing the new paradigm as a threat, should view it as an opportunity to break out of the ugliness of our current culture and join with the rest of the world in creating a new renaissance. 
one that celebrates the great discoveries of the past in science, in the arts, in statecraft, and demonstrates that the love of our fellow human beings is the most powerful force in the universe, as it's the force which comes from recognizing our fellow human beings as creative and who are deserving of a right to a good life. That's what the idea of win-win is that the Chinese discuss. Mutual benefit. Development is the new name of peace. Uh, I'll be linking at the bottom of the description page today a press release that discusses what went on at the first day of the Schiller Institute conference from last Saturday. I hope you'll read it. As soon as we get the videos posted, I'll, I'll put the links available for you. Again, our enemies are within our own government. And it's a government which is controlled, which, I mean, it's the enemies which control both parties and which are insisting on sustaining the rules-based order, which is collapsing the world and threatening to bring us to the brink of nuclear war. So instead of being afraid of Russia and China, let's mobilize for this higher peace movement. Thank you, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Hello, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our videos. Support our independence to produce videos like these. Become a member of the LaRouche organization at thelarouche.org slash member. By becoming a member for $25 or more, you'll get special access to the EIR Alert Daily Briefing and Weekly Magazine which is what I read to stay on top of things.